worked at NSA for over 28 years, holding various leadership positions within, within both focus areas of NSA, the Information Assurance and the Signal Intelligence mission. He's a technologist at heart and began his career as an engineer. He put those engineering skills to good use, so I understand, during his time as a scoutmaster, where, until lawyers got in the way, he enjoyed participating with the scouts in the annual World Championship of Punkin' Chunkin', building a contraption to fire pumpkins for distance. I think it was a record. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Rob Joyce. I'd like to uh, thank FCA for bringing together all of us today um, over the next two days to talk about cybersecurity education because I think um, I don't have to sell the folks in this room very hard on the urgency and importance of the topic. Right? So I'm going to tell you some personal stories throughout the morning um, uh, about how I've connected into the cyber culture, the cyber educational pipeline, and, and tell you some of the things that NSA is investing in and, and hopefully inspire you in your, in your works, whether it's commercial, government, individual, academic, to think about what more we can do as a community together, because um, I think there's great strength in our numbers here. Um, I, I'll talk through three different ways that uh, I personally have been involved in cyber education, and, and that's really the formal educational process the on-the-job training and mentorship path, and then the, the informal kind of self-driven educational path. And, and I'll talk to that a little bit as well. Um, I, I think the thing we all have to recognize is that, that there is just not enough skilled talent to go around to meet the growing, rising need um, for cyber um, throughout the community. If, if you step back and look, there's a, an activity called cyberseek.org. That's one the government runs. We put together um, a state-by-state -state analysis of where the job shortfalls and openings are. And right now, there's 320,000 open cyber jobs across the U.S. That means if we had the talent, they would fill that job today. So there's, there's, um, there's a growing gap between what we need, have and what we need. Um, the, the projections get much worse. Um, a, a Cisco report says that um, by 2020, we're going to need a million. There's going to be a gap of a million talented professionals between what we have and what we need. And a Monster.com report this year put out and, and uh, dropped over the top of that number and said it's a two million gap. So whatever yardstick or measure you use, um, we're not there. So we've got to make some systemic changes to address that gap. Um, I would say from the NSA's perspective, um, we provide ourselves, we pride ourselves in being um, a leader inside the government in both the quality and the quantity of cyber professionals we have, right? In, in, if you look across the various elements, um, it, it's really hard to find a concentration that's more dense and more deep um, than NSA. And, and why is that? It's because we have for decades been investing in um, education both inside our house and outside. Um, one of those paths I mentioned is that formal education path. And I told you I'd tie that to, to some personal um, connections. I grew up as an electrical and computer engineer. Um, I, I went to school um, for engineering. I picked the university that was the first university in the country to give give every incoming freshman a computer. Um, at the time, their tuition went up three thousand dollars, exactly what it cost for a personal computer at that day. Um, but but it was an emphasis on co growing computer technology that was important to me, right? But it was that idea that you can go to a formal setting, learn from others who tell you the things you need to know, um, and develop you that was really important. Um, so, so a key component of that viable long-term strategy for our nation has got to be getting people into that education pipeline. If you look at the, um, at the graduate level, undergraduate and graduate level education pipeline, um, it's, 
under 65,000 people will come out with um, undergraduate degrees in computer and information science fields. So under 65,000 will emerge. That's not cybersecurity. That's all of the IT and computer science across the country. Right? That, that's a scary figure when we say we're, we've got 300,000, more than 300,000 open jobs, and we're heading toward a couple million open jobs. But that's the formal pipeline, right? People who are going to get bachelor's degrees, not all of them will stay in the U.S., right? We educate some of the world's um, computer technologists. The interesting thing about that dynamic, though, is um, if you look at that, at that 65,000 people, um, 12,000 of them are women, and even less are minorities. So I think if you're looking for a strategic lever that the nation has to pull, the first thing we've got to do is we've just got to balance that pipeline out to represent our population. If we can get women into the computer science, cybersecurity field at the same level that we've got men to, to attract to that, um, we will see a substantial increase in that pipeline. Same thing for minorities, right? If the computer science output look like the demographics of our country, um, we would up those numbers significantly. So there's one of the first leverage points that I think we as a group can be talking about over the next two days is how do we build that pipeline that brings women and minorities into these fields at the same quantities, at the same levels, and the same pace um, as the white males. Um, another component of that is trying to get the base of the pyramid larger. And that goes all the way back to STEM education, science, technology, math, um, education. Um, we've got to be inspiring our kids um, into these disciplines so that they're deciding that they want to be cybersecurity professionals. Um, if you look at NSA, we've invested a couple ways in, in broadening that pyramid. So um, up around Fort Meade, we have an enormous amount of volunteer effort where people who work for NSA can take time during their work day to go out and teach and mentor at local high schools, local um, grade schools, in science and math topics. We have a, uh, we have a series of exercises. We'll, we'll supply those um, to our folks. They'll go out to a school and they'll teach uh, uh, an afternoon on crypto math. There's a there's a um, there's an analytic um, exercise where we take a bag of M and M's and we do statistical sorting and look at the colors. And through that process, where the kids get sugar, um, they get to understand the statistics behind the distribution of colors inside an M and M bag. We talk through the Ed Edgar Allan Poe classic gold bug where there's a cipher inside his story and talk the kids through cryptography. There's computer science classes and other things. Um, so, so that outreach is something where we do a mentorship and an engagement, but it's through the auspices of NSA where we actually allow our people um, time on the clock to build that base. We've done other things like starting something called the Gen Cyber Camp. Um, those Gen Cyber Camps are aimed at Children from K to 12 um, during the summer can take a week-long summer camp um, and be focused on cyber topics, education on cybersecurity, understanding the career opportunities, but it's all built around fun activities to try to get them connected to and inspired into the STEM field. Those gen cyber camps can also be for educators. So we run some of those camps where it's not just for the students to go and participate, but we're taking teachers and inspiring them to be able to teach in um, cyber topics. So that camp started in 2014 with eight camps. Um, by 2018 now, we've sponsored 150 camps. Um, those are across the, uh, across the country. Um, we saw 43 states. Um, Puerto Rico and the District of Columbia, all sponsoring camps um, last summer. And uh, going back to my comments that we have to increase the diversity in cybersecurity, 43% of the Gen Cyber attendees were female. 
Um, we also saw about 50% of the attendees minority or economically disadvantaged students. So what we do at NSA is we do grants for these, uh, um, for these gen cyber camps. And it turns out last year we could have run 300 camps if we had the funding and support to, uh, to broaden it even faster and farther. So that's a challenge for some of the corporate sponsors here. Think about what you can be doing in a high leverage activity like these cyber camps where we're teaching teachers or where we're exposing STEM to minority and female students who might otherwise not be inspired. I witnessed firsthand kind of the, the difference it can make to attend a really enthusiastic, interesting um, event. Um, I had the chance to go to DEF CON a number of years ago. At the time, my 13-year-old son loved computers, but he loved them in the way of, I will sit down and I will play Minecraft. He didn't, he didn't want to understand how to make that game, how to tinker with it, and I got to be able to play with him in two ways, right? I took him to DEF CON where they had an event called DEF CON Kids. Now it's called Roots, um, which is a track just for um, students in, uh, in the DEF CON environment. Now, it's not for everybody. DEF CON is in the middle of Vegas. Um, it's as much a party as it is a cyber event. Um, but they have a, a room just for the kids. Um, they bring in almost all the major speakers who do a DEF CON talk or approach to come in and talk to the kids. They have everything from hands-on soldering stations and, and, uh, and uh, projects they can build. But they also have one-on-one um, -on -one engagements, and it really sparks the enthusiasm. My son came out of that event knowing and, and interested enough that he wound up going to college um, for cybersecurity. Um, he, he's working for a, a major company that's exhibiting out here right now. Um, he, has, um, he had that little switch flipped, right? It was that one event. And I think things like those gen cyber camps and the things um, at, at DEF CON and, and security B-sides around the country who run some kids' tracks, those are really important things for us as a community to reach down and bootstrap some people into the technology that might not otherwise be interested. So we're working that formal education in a couple other ways. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, we sponsor Centers for Academic Excellence in Cybersecurity. So these are post-secondary education opportunities, um, undergraduate and graduate levels, um, and these attempt to increase the quality and availability of cybersecurity education. These are aimed at specifying some of the curriculum and important technologies that people ought to be thinking about to be involved in cybersecurity education. And right now there's 266 four-year um, graduate programs that have designated cybersecurity academic excellent programs. Um, the grad, they graduate about 9,500 students a year um, who have focus on cybersecurity. Now that's a drop in the bucket against that 300,000, right? but it is something where we're trying to not only increase the quantity, but the quality of things you can focus on. Um, the other thing that I'm really proud about that I would guess most of you have not heard about yet in this audience is um, a national cybersecurity education curriculum program. So this program was started with OMB funding, NSA driving um, the ideas and the implementation on this. Um, but we issued 52 grants to develop cybersecurity curriculum, free, open source, um, to be used across the country at educational um, institutions. So places where they desire to teach some courses, but they don't have the curriculum to support it, there is now free and open source curriculums for cybersecurity. So I would encourage you to go out to um, clark.center and you will see that free and open source curriculum. Two challenges for you. One, go out, see it, and encourage your affiliated local university, um, community college to pick up that and start offering cybersecurity. But also, um, it's a place you can contribute. So there are, um, there are specifications to build a, a learning module um, and put it into that repository where it's peer reviewed. So the idea is, um, you, you can have somebody who's really enthusiastic but doesn't know their stuff, who puts something out there. We're, we're committed 
and using our resources to make sure it's high quality educational material. So Clark.Center, Clark is an acronym, Cybersecurity Labs and Resource Knowledge Base. So it's, it's meant to be this growing repository of cybersecurity um, 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 curriculum that teachers across the country can tap, or actually across the world can tap, but we're focused on expanding this community. So that's the formal education path, right? We're, we're heavily invested in that, and as a nation, we've got to be at, uh, investing in that path. But another part for the industry segment, for the government segment here, we've got to think about uh, on-the-job training. So a lot of the best cybersecurity professionals are not the products of our universities. And in fact, what we've found is, um, you know, some of the best come out of the uniform um, services. They come out with a high school educational program, go into a tech school in the military. Um, they get significant on-the-job experience and exposure through that and then come out um, at the end of their service with huge talents, no degree, but huge talent. Um, and, and I think industry is starting to recognize that as a pipeline. We in government had to work hard at NSA to really change the way the government looked at people emerging with that kind of experience. So in a past life, I headed Tailored Access Operations, TAO, the hackers at NSA. And what we found were the people that came through the services that we taught to do that hacking um, <clears throat> were actually on the job for two, three, four years um, who emerged from that and, and wanted to retire, separate, and come into NSA um, were offered um, jobs in the government going down the formula list that said high school education, Army graduate, um, X amount, right? It really was not commensurate with the talents they had. We had to devise new and creative ways in our, our HR process, which in the government is not easy, to bring those people on accredited at the level of experience they deserved. And so we're much better now at hiring that talent in at the level commensurate with, um, with what um, industry will, uh, will also pick up those folks. We also started working with a couple universities to give credit for the internal training we do. So now people coming out, having been hackers inside the military, um, have a head start onto a full degree where they only have to complete a little bit more coursework um, to get their bachelor's and then have that, um, that certification that, that, that recognizes um, the training and experience we gave them in the government. So I think um, what we'll find as, as Cybercom grows, as the, the uh, service um, cyber elements grow, that pipeline of talent coming out of the military is going to help us address some of that 300, 400,000 person gap that we're seeing out in, uh, in, in the, uh, the industry needs. So at NSA, we've recognized that um, internal NSA cybersecurity, um, where we teach our own, has to be a major component of satisfying that gap because we can't hire everybody we need. So we have um, a national cryptologic school. We have our own internal training university. We're blessed with having the capacity and scale to be able to teach inside ourselves. Um, in uh, 2018, we created um, the cybersecurity education curriculum, which is multidisciplinary training focused on um, information assurance and the cyber operations blended together. Um, we teach things like ICS and SCADA um, technologies internal to ourselves. We teach fundamentals of risk management. We teach about um, concept for cryptography and keys. Um, we even do some things on quantum computing awareness, right? So we're looking at some of that cutting edge technology and trying to educate our folks because what we find is um, cyber topics are not static. So that, that would be my final focus is we all need to make a commitment to a lifelong learning if you're going to enter into the cyber discipline. My degree in, um, in computer engineering back in 1989 um, gave me some basis for what I'm doing today, um, but the technologies I was exposed to there have very, very few 
direct connections to the kind of things I need to know today, right? So, so that is one fundamental thing we found is the people who are the best in this field are actually lifelong learners. And one of the best assessment tools we found for like looking at the young talent coming in um, is not the grades they got in their cyber classes, is not an assessment test of the technology we know. Um, it, it's a simple question of, you know, how do you spend your free time? If you show me somebody who's got a Raspberry Pi and they played with it on their own out of self-generated interest, um, we find those people top the charts on the other end when we give them opportunities to learn and develop. They're the kinds of people who come out on the other end just being the rock stars. So, so um, again, that goes all the way back to the, the efforts we do to try to inspire and, and get folks interested early to where they have a passion to continue that learning and focus all the way, all the way along. So I'd hope you agree. I think NSA is investing heavily um, into cybersecurity education, both internally for selfish reasons, but externally for the nation, uh, because we think it really is a national security challenge, right? The nations that are able to secure, operate, defend their cyber capabilities they are the ones who are going to survive and flourish in the coming decades, right? So we as a nation really need to make the pivot in STEM education and technology. We need to create the opportunities. We have to inspire the generation. And frankly, we have to use all of our society um, in this space. And I think that's one of the great, um, great things about the military is, right, they bring that diversity and give opportunities across our society um, that some may not have, right? The folks that may not be able to go to a Carnegie Mellon um, for cybersecurity education could be identified early as having an affinity and a, and a capability trained up and wind up being one of the leaders in this cybersecurity environment. So with that, um, I'd ask you to do your part, right? Whether it's you individually thinking about volunteering for one of these gen cyber camps, the Air Force's Cyber Patriot, you know, the, the poster boards that were mentioned out here, get those kids inspired and connected. Um, think about your organizations, whether it's government or industry, what can you sponsor developing curriculums, encouraging um, events and opportunities to come to, these, uh, come to these, uh, these developmental activities, or whether it's just providing resources, right? I mentioned Gen Cyber could have done 50% more camps this year with the proper resourcing. Um, there's huge opportunities out there. I think the fact that you're here means you're willing to contribute. Let's get creative and drive this space. So I'll be around through lunch. Happy to talk to you. I've, I'm just about out of time, so I'm not going to take questions up here directly, but I'm happy to talk to any of you on the sidebars. So thank you for your time and attention. Well, uh, you know, there's no doubt you're a scoutmaster at heart. He's uh, given us a challenge and has great interest in the youth of our nation. Uh, Rob, thanks so much. Uh, this was uh, a great challenge. You heard General Morrison offer a challenge to us with regard to see, let's figure out an action plan on as we move this process forward. And Rob, thank you for uh, identifying those pipelines and giving us some insight into what's coming. But 300,000 is a pretty big target out there. Uh, I'm an old economist. I, I want to say your first lesson in college was better. It was uh, that, uh, that $3,000 computer, indeed. But we're thankful that you're part of the leadership in the uh, NSA and leadership in our nation in this area. Let's give him a hand again, by the way. I think that was a great set of uh, insights. <laughs> On behalf of uh, you, uh, Rob, we'll present uh, a donation to Fisher House. Thank you very much for joining with us today. Uh, we're going to move right into our next speaker. I'm, I'm scanning out here. I believe uh, our next speaker is out there in the audience. Uh, right, all right, there he is, all right. Um, we are going to move into our next uh, speaker, and that's uh, General Crawl. I want to I put my glasses on to make sure I touch a couple points because he's got uh, some distinguished uh, background, of course, but his current positions are equally distinguished. Uh, some understanding now at the DOD level, some national policy and programs impacting the cyber workforce, and it will be presented by Brigadier General Dennis Crawl, United States Marine Corps, 
Principal Deputy Cyber Advisor in the Office of the Secretary of Defense. Uh, he was promoted into this position from the U.S. Uh, Marine Corps, where he served as CIO for the Marine Corps from July 2015 to February 2018. His role on OSD is to serve as the primary advisor to integrate and oversee the development of all DOD cyber capabilities, activities, and policies, as well as provide senior military perspective on cyber policies, strategies, and plans which guide DOD efforts in cyberspace. Um, I recall uh, an address we had with General Crawl where he identified what he was doing with regard to information and a variety of cyber activities and communicating activities in the Marine Corps and really set an azimuth and pace for what the Marine Corps is underway with. Uh, very important business. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming General Crawl. Hi, sir. Thank you. Well, good morning. I'm probably going to be loud for two reasons. One is the mic, but the other is I'm pretty excited. Uh, I've got sort of a script. We'll see how well I do to stay on it. Uh, I've really, uh, maybe first observation, I appreciate uh, Rob Joyce's remarks. Uh, while they're enlightening about the future of cyber and the qualifications and interest, uh, it's also depressing for me personally because I don't think I meet any of those qualifications. Uh, kind of a litmus test. I've got some work to do. Uh, what I'd like to do this morning is uh, we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to get a little bit bigger. Uh, while we, you know, the conference itself really focuses on education and training, that education and training is, is assembled for one reason and one reason only. Uh, it's war fighting. That's what it's about. So my conversation with you this morning, hopefully for about the next 20 minutes, and then I'd like to leave the other half of our time to, to answer your questions or take them and to answer them later if I can't handle them up here. Uh, but we're going to think big. We're going to talk about strategy, first of all. We're going to talk about some of the thematics that come from that strategy. Uh, we're going to boil it down in only a few words because really it communicates a couple broad themes uh, in how we frame the way that we build the force, the way we build our infrastructure, uh, what we're protecting, uh, what we're defending, what we're fighting for. And then I'd like to give you inside baseball as I see it. I want to give you some unofficial themes. Uh, that I think will set the tone for what the department's going to do this year. And then lastly, I'd like to leave you with what I would consider to be the help wanted sign. Uh, we can't get there alone. Uh, we're going to need some uh, industry and academic uh, academia help uh, to get us across the finish line. So there's some gaps in the way that we think uh, that we can't fill, and we're going to ask your assistance to get us there. What I've got in the backdrop here is, is a cartoon chart. Uh, I'm not going to go through this, but I really wanted to set the stage for how we look at our, uh, really our, our environment uh, when it comes to cyber. We've used this chart to, to brief just about everybody. Uh, it's simplistic, it's fraught with a few errors, it's two-dimensional, it reads linearly from left to right when really some of these things are fairly ubiquitous. The bottom line is this, there's a ton of activities when we start looking at our cyber environment that we must be able to talk at the same time. Areas that are neglected on one side for the sake of something else means we have a system. If you think of this uh, from an engineering perspective as a pressurized system, leave an end cap off one of these and you've got a problem. You've got the IT golden box that sits on one side, which is really our first four in the department, what we're looking to get after here in fiscal year 19. They're the same things the services have been driving at. This is about endpoint management, ICAM, uh, and uh, really our development uh, DevOps, secure DevOps. Uh, and in the workforce, which is one of the reasons we're here to talk today. Uh, we've got cross-domain uh, that we've got to solve for. We've got a tactical edge uh, that involves our weapon systems, position, navigation, and timing, and encryption. And if you look at what undergirds these, the human factors or that insider threat that we're worried about, our critical infrastructure, our defense industrial base, all of these are important. It's not a matter of choosing which of these to do. It's a matter of prioritizing how we go about making those improvements and doing so smartly. Uh, so that will be a little bit of our focus. As a Benny, uh, I know it's small print, but I'm going to cover what our fiscal year 19 objectives are uh, that we're looking to drive through the department this year. Hopefully that will be news uh, and somewhat informative to you. So when you think about the cyber strategy, it's been an interesting year uh, for OSD. Our strategy was a bit stale. You know, these things are perishable. Uh, the strategy uh, came out, uh, really started work in 2013, published in 2015. Uh, and uh, in three years' time, four years' time, a lot of the tenants that were involved, in some cases, really were OBE. 
Uh, they, were, they passed us by, technology has driven us to a different location, and we were kind of chasing the wrong objectives. So what the department did was publish its first strategy in a few years, that's out, uh, followed by a posture review, those gaps that we have, so that we can tie resources to them. And then what I would consider to be this year's uh, really theme is implementation. General Morrison said it best, I think, in the opening, when he talked about simply recording it or doing it, right? So if there was a theme or a banner I would have up here, this is the year that we're gonna do the things that we described. Not admire them, but get after them. And we have some interesting openings for that. So what does this mean in the cyber strategy? Probably, if you sat down and read the classified version, you'd need to be well rested and hydrated, uh, right? You need to make sure it's at the right time of day, you got the right mood, and you go through that document. It's a fantastic document, but it's fairly lengthy. But there are about 18 key words that come into that, and I'm gonna give you those 18 words and we can talk a little bit about them. The first step is about increasing lethality. Make no mistake, if you only had one takeaway, that's what it's about. Again, it's the warfighter. This is making sure that we have the tools available, the information that's pushed at the right time and right place and we can engage. That mirrors the national defense strategy with the opening tenant is increasing lethality. This is about defending forward. A lot of articles written on this. I would just suggest to you not to overcomplicate it. This is what forward leaning looks like. I had someone describe this to me uh, some time ago in very simplistic terms. That you know, if you like wrestling or wrestling, depending on where you're from, uh, you know, there's a, there's a couple parts to the match. Uh, the first one, uh, maybe sitting on the sidelines looking at your opponent. The second one is in the ring and there's hands on, but you're really not throwing down, and then game on. Uh, there's people getting taken to the mat. Thinking about defending forward is that hands-on approach. It's that day-to-day -day engagement, which is what follows uh, in the next series of themes. This is about constant contact. Uh, military advantage. We have a military advantage, but only if we protect it. This is about partners. Stopping exfil, giving away our secrets long before they even make it to us in some cases, whether they be in the lab or in our academic institutions. We've got to safeguard those. We've got to defend our infrastructure, which is vulnerable. You realize how much of our bases and stations our weapon systems depend on. Adversaries are smart. You can poke at these things on the peripherals and degrade us in ways we couldn't even mention. And then what we're here today to talk about is how do we build that talent? How do we garner it? How do we develop it? And then really, most importantly, how do we keep it? So there's your cyber strategy. 18 keywords with a little of voiceover from me. We also have some themes uh, from DOD objectives uh, that are important to keep in mind. This is about achieving our mission. We get measured on mission. Everything we do is based on mission threads. If we talk about vulnerability, if we talk about where we're driving or how we're spending money, it needs to be mission. And our missions are pretty clear. They're framed in the national defense strategy. Those mission threads are pulled apart in the cyber strategy. And that posture review looks at each and every one of those for strengths and weaknesses. We're a mission-oriented group. And we need to ensure that when we talk about technology, and we talk about people, and we talk about training and education, it all goes back, not for its own sake. We don't do cyber for cyber. We don't educate for education's sake, and we don't buy gear for gear's sake. We do that for the warfighting mission that we can accomplish. Cyber needs to be integrated, not stood alone, not treated uniquely. It's an enabler, and it's gotta be folded into our normal way and conduct and course of business and operations. We've got to defend our infrastructure, as I've mentioned. That means to deter and preempt the adversary intrusion. And they understand where our secrets are. It's in our data. We've got to secure our information. It's not about securing networks as much as securing the information that are on those networks or in those networks. And then lastly, building partnerships. What this really means is that we can't go it alone. DOD can't be the big protector of everyone. We've got to make sure that when we fight, and we fight with partnerships, and we fight with coalition, when we come together that we have some level of common ground and understanding. Otherwise, the threat always goes for that, that most alluring vector, right? And we've got to make sure that we can do that in an integrated way. So there's the official uh, piece and opener. But I'm going to give you General Crowell's unstated themes for DOD cyber, and it's free, by the way. You don't need a ticket for this. This is free, part of your, uh, your admission process here today. 
I'm going to give you kind of where I think we're headed. Everything that we talk about is going to be rooted in a risk calculation and priority. The layout that I just gave you in the National Defense Strategy and the posture review is how we're framing the way we look at the department. We talked about lethality, but we need to make sure that our risk calculation has a few parts to it. Everything is inherently risky. You can justify just about anything you want and move it up to the top of the priority chain until you realize if everything's a priority, then of course nothing is. We've got to start looking at what our really a four part uh, examination of our risk calculation. What is the vulnerability that we're talking about? Do we even have one? We then have to take a look at the adversary. Does the adversary have the capability to exploit that vulnerability? It's the second part. The third part we look at is the adversary predisposed to go after that vulnerability. Intent really does matter. And then lastly, even if all those three were lined up, what is the impact? If the adversary was successful, what's the impact to our warfighting mission? Through those four lenses, we can then set priorities in the department of how we're going to proceed. Too many times we have empty warnings of, well, that's a threat and that's a vulnerability. It's got to move to the top. Not necessarily. Show me anything in cyber that is not risky. Show me anything in cyber that is foolproof. I was raised by a Marine dad of 31 years, and he gave me probably the best advice I ever had about Marines. I think it applies here, about risk-free. He told me that you could take a Marine, put a Marine in a padded cell, give that Marine two bowling balls, come back in an hour, one will be broken, one will be missing. And I believe it's a true statement. The impossible happens. And the impossible happens in cyber as well. It's no different. Everything is inherently risky. Every, every significant capability we have has some undoing that comes along with it. We've got to be smart. The other piece is uh, this coordinated POAM, this plan of attack and milestone. We've had a lot of POA, a lot of plan of attack and no milestone. No way to look at resourcing, no dates, the endless tracking of all of these objectives. Days are gone. This is about a system view of the environment, as I have back here, looking at these known weaknesses and trying to get after them. We have more in common between the services, the fourth estate, and even our, and our SAP communities, by the way, that we need to start leveraging, especially when it comes to IT and how we handle information. Yet we've treated these things differently for so long. Far more in common, which means common solutions. This is a bad year for stovepipe solutions, things that are unique, things that have service designators stamped next to them uh, as a unique way to do business. They're not going to survive scrutiny. Uh, in fact, I would tell you last year it was hard to get some of these through. Expect every year as we go through, we have to find common ground. We cannot afford to do business differently to a point that it, it's costly and less effective. Focused on outcomes. If last year was the year of authorities and strategy, which I think it was, especially in the policy realm of OSD, this is the year of implementation. This is the year we get after doing the things that we talked about. Congress is intently interested. They got the message. They know what we're buying. They know what we're spending. They want to know how we're tracking it. They want to know what our milestones are and what our detractors are from reaching them. So we have an interesting year to show results. We're not waiting on the traditional fit-up kickoff uh, of 20 and out. We're starting that with reprogramming actions and money in 19. Many of those initiatives already underway. That means eliminating friction points, finding what prevents us from getting to a yes, and metrics and gauges on everything we do. Measures of effectiveness. Being busy and spending money is no longer the good mark, right? We have this quadrant that I talk about frequently that I try and avoid, and that is it doesn't work, but at least it's expensive, right? We've got, to, we've got to stay out of that business of saying that we've been good spenders of cash, but we really don't have the outcomes to show for it. We have to show results. This is about points on the board. That would be another one I would share with you. We're fond of pathfinders, pilots, studies. Many of these I consider meanderings or wanderings that don't even, they've outlived their purpose by the time they eventually inform. There's nothing, there's not even people left around to understand why we did the study to begin with. 
We've had vectors that these studies have gone off that have been returned to me now that were started five, six, seven years ago, and those programs aren't even there. So I guess what I would share with you is getting to an outcome sooner, right? Winning now at some percentage is better than winning later never. And that's what we're driving at. We're looking at real change. We want to learn why we do. And so many times we're taking some risk up front and we're getting the machine moving and we're learning while we're flying. So points on the board. And the last that I would leave you with, measures of effectiveness. This is all about making sure that we are good stewards of the, of the resources that we get. I made comparisons the other day to a few, and I'll tell you, I'm an, I'm an old I.O. individual, an old I.O. officer. Um, years ago, we got big, big sums of money to move through the battlefield and do things, and we were the I.O., information operations, was the darling of the department. The idea was to win wars without ever firing a shot, uh, to influence the adversary in ways that I think was described really more of hypnotism than influence, uh, and that we were going to just do these magical things, and so money flowed. Well, our past sins have caught up with us, because what we didn't have was the ability to show what needles we moved. We were effective in some areas, but we didn't take the time to measure it. We didn't have the reflective uh, pieces in place for us to determine how well we did. We didn't know how to reinforce success and stop things that wasn't working. And eventually Congress said, show me what you did with that money. And over the years, we had trouble accounting for it, and we were rightly reined in. I'll tell you that cyber is on a very similar path. Five, seven years ago, you uttered the word cybersecurity, doors flew open, and money was given to you because the great fear of having some type of cyber compromise or incident. But we're being asked, and rightly so, to account for the way that we're spending money. And I'll tell you, if we're not careful about what we do, it won't be long before we're answering those same questions. And it's hard for us to ask for a, you know, leniency and opening of the door to move to more agile acquisition uh, if we can't account for what we do with our current funding. So I'll tell you, I think those are the themes that you'll be seeing this year. We've got big enablers in the department. You're tracking these. I'll answer questions on them where I can. But we know that the cloud uh, we say the cloud is coming, the cloud is here, but in the military's version of how that cloud will be hosted and provisioned, it's on the way. We've stood up an effort, a formal effort in the department to define and, uh, and move our way forward. We're still working pieces out. I don't have all the detailed answers on how that cloud uh, final contract will settle, but the requirements have been captured. Artificial intelligence. Uh, we have an, our first director and that capability being stood up because you realize you can't really have AI prowess if you don't have a cloud uh, for this to ride in. The two really go hand in hand with a lot of the uh, advancements that we've talked about. Zero trust network is in our future. We can no longer build our castle walls higher or deeper. It's about data protection, not about network protection. And our networks have to be modernized. They have not aged well, by the way. And we can no longer keep pace. It's too expensive. Securing the defense industrial base is another one uh, that we've got to get after. Uh, again, we talked about how porous that is. That's where our secrets are kept, and we've got to make sure that we, uh, we take care of our partners uh, in that endeavor. So getting into the first four in the department, what hangs off in the little gray and blue box on the left side here, I want to cover the first three just very quickly to set the stage, and then I want to get uh, dwell a little bit on workforce, since that's really the focus of today's uh, efforts. Um, we have endpoint management. Talked about perimeter a little bit, uh, how we define that. For fiscal year 19, the department is committed uh, to a complete nipper and sipper comply to connect solution, meaning that that's instantiated on our networks. There's pieces of comply to connect and how we define it. There are three parts that we look at. The first is to detect, right? You would like to think you can see any network and the endpoints that you own. Uh, the second piece to that comply to connect solution involves qualification. Once you see, can you make a determination what you do with that machine? Does it join the session? Does it get quarantined? Does it get patched in progress? And then lastly, do we have an automated way to remediate? So the department's goal for 19 is not to do all three. There's probably a couple planes we could look at. Uh, first plane on comply to connect could involve an operating system, which it will. Secondly, we'll move into all IP, all blinking lights, all peripherals. Thirdly, mobile device management configuration. 
and then lastly, the tactical edge. So if you looked at those four items, where they actually cross for fiscal year 19, we want to detect everything with an OS on Nipper and Sipper. We want automated roll-up reports. We want licensing configuration, hardware configuration. We want to see what's out there. We want to make sure we have our domains mapped. That's fiscal year 19's goal on endpoint management. For identification, credentialing, uh, and access management, or ICAM, we're going to move away from CAC. We're not moving away in 19, but that's the goal. We've got to take and leverage better uh, the multi-factor authentication pieces that are out there. And for 19, we're finally going to tackle PKI for mobile devices, which have been a little sluggish for us. Thirdly, on DevSecOps, uh, we're, I think, kind of necking down expectations, but they're the most powerful ones. This is about tailored tool sets delivered and really a developer's toolkit for us to, to, to work operations or our software in ways that we haven't before. We can't afford to do business the way we do it now, right? We contract it out. There's some level of pen testing. It comes back to us. We test it again. We find vulnerabilities. We send it out to the fleet. They find vulnerabilities. And by then, the software is almost OBE right when it's ready to put it on the network. Uh, yet when you start looking at how industry does business, this agile approach, this constant change, this ability to flex very quickly, to, to break, fail, fix, and reconstitute, there's no reason we can't take advantage of it. That's a departmental goal for 19. And then let's get to the workforce. The workforce itself, we've got a couple key tracks. We've had some great success over the past couple of years. I want to cover a little of it and then talk about where we're going. The first is to build and manage this workforce really from a coding and training perspective. We're trying to get our idea of what we own, what we have. We have no good inventory, by the way. I've made comments before in, in different forums in AFSEA of the challenge of the, on the military side, even the civilian side at times, of this myth mythical thing called the position descriptor, or PD. Uh, it is probably one of the most unreliable indicators of what we really have in the workforce. We hire people on on position descriptors, and then they go off and do other things, and they change jobs, and they, they you know, normally advance through the process, and then yet we still have the same tag on the drawer that doesn't match the contents in the drawer. So our forces are growing, and we don't necessarily have a good accountability of, of how they're growing. So this idea of coding what those are, coming up with common standards, so between services and, and our civilian and military side, we know what a certain work set means. And you don't have to do the interpretation when they move from one area to another. That's underway. And then we're going to capitalize on the department's authorities. And we have several, by the way, uh, that we've got. We have a cyber accepted service. Most of you uh, know and are familiar with what that is. But it's got components and a feature of a rollout. We have the non-competitive movement, which is a key, uh, between uh, cyber accepted service or our GG uh, coded individuals to the competitive service in GS so we can port them fairly quickly. We have qualifica qualifications-based advancement opportunities. So you can move up based on your training and your competence rather than time served, which is unfortunately a frequent gate in government service. Increased pay scales up to step 12s, which matter in some cases. Uh, plan for this coming up year and years out, the uh, strategic cyber recruitment and outreach. I'll tell you, having done a couple of recruiting tours, I believe we do not know the market very well. We talk in a lot of anecdotal uh, conversations about what the department needs in its recruiting, why people don't stay, why people join to begin with. I've heard it all. They sound very similar, and they sound reasonable, but I have no idea if it's right. So when I talk to individuals, they seldom match our preconceived conceptions. We need to take a look at what the market is producing. We need to ensure that it's understood what we offer. You know, DOD has some selling points that you can't get in other places. We don't compete with industry and pay in all cases, in fact, most cases. But the allure to what we do in mission, in satis people being satisfied with the job they do, the ability to touch cutting edge technology and to perform actions you can only do legally in our environment is more in some cases than pay. We've got to take a hard look at to make sure that we understand what recruitment looks like as we onboard folks and what it means to keep them. And we don't have to keep all of them, by the way. This idea that anyone who leaves the service or anyone who leaves our civilian field, clearly we've done something wrong, it's not true. Not everybody joins forever. Not everybody's content to be in a certain area. There's a whole bunch of factors. 
But the key is to those individuals who they leave, do they leave with a good feeling, being satisfied for what was offered? That's what we're really taking a look at. Targeted local market supplements. The ability to pay and have pay enhancements based on regional cost of living beyond what's offered today is in the works. Retention bonuses that are immune to pay caps because right now we have formulas that make it very difficult for us to apply multiple enhancements, but easing those restrictions. And then probably the biggest killer to onboarding is uh, our security clearance process. For probably two decades, I've heard people stand on stages and talk about how they're going to reform that process. And I have seen zero progress. What I have seen, though, the people who promised a change were right. It's gotten worse. Uh, so I will say their prediction of change did come true, just not in the right direction. So there's an effort afoot. I'm far more convinced and believing that we're going to make progress this go around than we have in the past. I think we've got the right attention on it. I think we understand areas that can be automated, how we can get after quality checks, uh, but also trying to match that at pace and speed. We've got to get the onboarding right. We've lost more people because they simply can't get to work. They show up and they sit in an outer office without the clearance and they get bored and they leave. It's got to be corrected. But let me give you a, uh, and then on the military side, direct commissioning and constructive credit. Two areas that came to us that we've got to find a smart way to use. The constructive credit piece is easy. We're able to, to quantify uh, the actual service and experience people have. Uh, that's a pretty easy one. Uh, the direct commissioning, we've just got to get a better feel for what that means when we bring people in and at what level. So the services are taking a hard look at that. But let me give you a cautionary tale on people. I really appreciate uh, Rob's opening comments on what's out there uh, for job opportunities because those, those numbers are staggering and they're real. But we also have to be very smart. We have to make sure that we have a few descriptors that go in the front of the way we hire people. It's not just about the races on to hire as many people as we can, and no one's advocating that. But if we're not smart about what we're doing, we're going to be in a spot that we might not be able to afford what we have. The key is the targeted application of the right people. Automating things where automation can lend itself. But somewhere between 65 and 85% of our budget right now in IT proper goes to humans. Now, it's our most guarded and valuable commodity, but think about that. If that figure continues to rise, there's really no money left in that equation to do the modernization of the things that we talked about. So what is the right balance? Can the service, can our civilian workforce handle these interruptions in the way that we deal with budgets? While budgets ride at a certain level today, What's the budget going to be like to pay for this workforce three or four years from now? Who knows? We're having trouble determining what that budget's going to be three to four months from now. But if we build ourselves in an unsustainable future, what does that mean to the faith we keep with the people we hire today if they're not here in two or three years? So the key really is being smart about how we do this. Making sure that we understand. So in the department... We're now starting to take a look at what a zero-based review, workforce review, looks like for us. We're finding in service level examinations that we're not matching well with industry standards in areas where industry might have a ratio uh, for, you know, some management to, you know, worker configuration. We find ourselves in the wrong end of those calculations almost all the time, which our industry partners tell us we are grossly inefficient at the way that we, we exercise our workforce. So reformation is coming. We need folks, no doubt. We need to make sure we hire the right folks. So where does that leave us with some help wanted? Talent management is probably my biggest concern when it comes to the workforce. It takes a concerted effort to stare at what you own, to stay in touch with the people you own, Take a look at all of the dynamics that we just described when it comes to development and retention, let alone recruiting. How do we manage the workforce that we have? What are the tools we use to do it? It's good that the department is going through